you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the participants that are online. We expect your questions and we will be very happy to get your inputs also on this. Today is about society and Karen Shea will share about Bridges, International Bridges to Justice. It's an organization and a movement to prevent torture against child if they are imprisoned by any cause in any of the countries. So she asked me to share our story. In, in this case, I'm working with Messengers of Peace. I'm in charge of the network. But I started with a project actually in El Salvador, which is in Central America. And in Central America, we have um, an issue with preventing violence and criminal activity. So there's a lot of young people involved in what is called gangs or in underprivileged in neighborhoods. We have many gangs or many young people exposed to that. And for many reasons, they, they end being part of that. So last two years ago, there was an event in our city where a bus was just take by some young people and put on fire with all the passengers inside, which was kind of a real hard event for our society. And I was looking at the news, and I was looking and individually reacting, like, how can this happen in my country? And I will, and for one moment, I thought, these people that are doing this, they they don't deserve to be free, or they don't deserve to be alive. And in that precise moment, I also thought that I'm a scout, and that I shouldn't be having that kind of thought. So it hit me that I was sitting on my living room watching the news, and that I was doing nothing to address that issue. And I, because I'm a scout. I believe we are in a privileged position of, in some way, we are adult leaders and young people listen to us, or we have the privileged position to have this huge network around us in our countries or in other countries that can actually help us. But I was sitting in my living room just watching the news. So I thought this is a violent cycle, and as any cycle that fits itself from violence and from my sudden thought of, I can't believe these people is living, I thought we need to do something totally opposite and maybe crazy. And maybe instead of projecting this uh, hate feeling of how can a human do this to another human, start doing something to love these people or to take care of these people, these people that are doing violence in our society. There is there, and as huge as that event was, as violent as that was, we need to do something in the same proportion good to people that are doing this. So we started a project to work with youth offenders that actually made criminal activities to involve them in scout activities and involve them to do service projects. And it was kind of a crazy idea. It was kind of something, let's try to see if it works. And it worked. In some way, we gathered 20 youth offenders with high criminal activity, with 20 scouts, and we worked together for six months to design five service projects. And they actually reached 500 beneficiaries. And I have to say that working with them, in no moment I felt unsafe. There was no pencil or any piece of material that was lost. And most of the people that were thinking about how can we expose our scouts to work with these people, actually discover that any young people that is exposed to something positive will react in the same way. So that's kind of my story, but I will share more about during our Messengers of Peace workshop on Sunday, but today's is about Karen's story, and it's similar. And 
sharing our stories about asking you, maybe there are similar stories in your country. Or maybe you are that privileged person that can actually reach to your networks and do something to address someone else's issue. And we really are in a privileged position. We really have a global network. And we need to find out how society can start listening to us because we really are everywhere. And we need to be aware of that power that we have. So I introduce Karen Shea. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here today with you. And I am so excited because I have not only come to know scouts through what I've read, and my mother was a girl guide in Hong Kong. So she, even though she didn't send me to the Girl Scouts, which I'm very disappointed about, would always say things like, because when I was a girl guide, <laughs> and so much of my understanding of how we persevere, on how we want to make this a better world, and how we can use our imagination, our prophetic imagination, to create something that is not yet in existence, but that we know we can step by step move towards it, also comes from my own mother, who would always say, and I was a girl guide. So I'm just so happy. I know that we have all come from so many different countries. And you know, one by one, and country by country, we have come together here as one. And I thank you. I thank you for coming here to be with me today. Because I, I will admit that this topic um, of ending torture as an investigative tool in our lifetime doesn't tend to be a very popular one. In fact, one time I had a lunch, and it was uh, everyone at their lunch table had their topic. And there were so many tables, and people were crowded all around other tables. There wasn't even places for them to sit. And I was sitting all by myself. <laughs> And I went and I, I said to some people, hey, come sit at my table, it's empty. And um, they kept saying, ah, it's not a very nice topic for lunch and we want to eat. So I'm always grateful for the courage of all of you who say, hey, let's be here together. Let's see what we can do. And they say that when you want to bring light, oftentimes we want to stay in light. And I think that's important. And at the same time, we recognize that sometimes in order to bring light, you have to go into the darkness and transform the darkness into light. And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who was a Buddhist monk, also said this. He was once asked, what do we need to do in order to save this world? And he paused and he thought about it. And um, many people thought, oh, he'll come up with a good strategic plan. And what he said was, he said, all we need to do to save the world is to first listen and allow ourselves to hear the cries and the pain of the world. And so I think that's what we do together to look at how we can create this. So as we start, I loved some of these quotes. These are some of my favorite quotes from the Boy Scouts and Messengers of Peace. One, I guess this is, every, you all probably know these already, but by Baden Powell, Leave this world a little better place than you found it. And the second one, which I loved, was we never fail when we try to do our duty. We always fail when we neglect to do it. So just starting with a little bit of my story of founding International Bridges of Justice, I was, um, I am, how can I say, I'm a Chinese American, and I was born in the States, and I was, initially a lawyer in the United States. And in 1994, I moved to Cambodia. And when I was there in 1994, I came across one day a 12-year-old boy who had been tortured and denied access to counsel. But what I found to be very interesting was that he was tortured and denied access to counsel, not because he was a political prisoner, but um, because he had stolen a bicycle. And what I found ironic about it was that um, the Cambodian government said, hey, if you want to help this 12-year-old boy, precisely because he's not a political prisoner, but just a 12-year-old boy who has stolen a bicycle, go ahead. 
And then I began to realize that there was a huge, just massive numbers of people, hundreds and thousands of people in the world, where government said, if you want to help these people, go ahead. But because they were not important political prisoners who had done something important for anybody, they were people who might have been accused of committing a crime, there was actually no one to protect them. And what we see today is that in the last years, in the last decade, out of the 113 countries that still practice investigative torture, 93 of these countries have all passed laws. And the laws say that you have a right to a lawyer and you have a right not to be tortured. So the laws are actually on the books. But unfortunately, torture in many places continues because it is the cheapest form of investigation. So it's unfortunately cheaper to torture people and to start breaking fingers than to actually give them a lawyer and go through the process. Now, one of the reasons I'm so excited to be here today is because it is an area that requires perseverance, hard work, and also, in some ways, a leap of imagination from people who can see that we can create a better world if we work on it step by step by step. And so when I read that quote, which I loved, which was, we never fail again to try to do our duty, we always fail when we neglect to do it, what I have realized in this world is that one of the reasons why we have not, as a world community, conquered this issue, because investigative torture for the majority of people is 100% preventable if we put a lawyer at an early stage, if we put scouts there as witnesses of peace, as messengers of peace, to be there as witnesses, that, that we can do this. But one of the reasons why is because, in fact, we have neglected to do it. That, that it's there, it's waiting for us, but sometimes it's really very scary. One of the people who has always inspired me in my lifetime as a lawyer, as a human rights lawyer, is not um, a very sophisticated lawyer, but in fact is a four-year-old boy who I always talk about. And the reason he inspired me is because I met him in Cambodia. And when I met him, um, he was actually born in one of the prisons. And because he was born in the prison, you know, all the guards loved him, right? He was just a baby. He was this big when they met him. And so um, as he grew bigger, you know, the guards would always let him, as he began to crawl and walk, they'd let him slip in and out of the bars because they said, ah, oh, you know, he's a, sorry, is that mine? <laughs> they, said, they said, you know, he's a baby. He's not going to do any harm. So they would let him slip in and out of the bars. But what happened is that as he grew bigger, um, it became harder and harder. That's probably my mom who's the girl guide. <laughs> Um, as, as, as he became bigger, what happens is that, you know, it grew harder and harder for him to slip through the bars, but he would still slip through bars. So he would gum into the bars, you know how the bars are, and he would go up to the first step, the second step, and the, you know, they're not steps, but they're, they're bars, right? He would go through the first, the second, and the third, and then he would slowly turn his body, and then he would go back down, three, two, one, and he'd always grab my pinky, because what he wanted to do is he wanted me to take him to visit the 156 prisoners. Now, he never went through all of them, but I would either pick him up and he would put his little two fingers through, still my, <laughs> and it's my mother, or he would go, he would go, she's the only one who has my number, so it is my mother for sure. <laughs> Promise it's my mom. Um, or he would go down in the dark cells and he would just put his fingers through. Now, what I found that was so remarkable about him is that most of the prisoners said to me, this little boy's name was Vishna. They said, Vishna is our greatest sunshine and our greatest hope. We wait for him all the time and every day. And what I always thought was inspiring to me was that here's this little boy. He's four years old. He's born in a prison with almost no, um, no people would say, without any po real power and without any real privilege. But he, like all of us, had a sense of his own heroic journey. And he said, you know, 
probably I've heard this from someone else, but um, I might only be one person, and I can't do everything, but I can do the one thing that I can do. So what can I do? And with that, he not only took care of the prisoners that he could take care of, but he inspired me, and he has inspired a whole movement of people to begin looking at, you know, what can we do as one individual person to make this happen? So I would like, and I don't know what we can do with, with uh, the camera, because I know that other people are watching. Maybe we could take a break. I would love to, just even really quickly, um, have you just introduce yourselves. Is that possible? And tell us what country you're from, and um, sort of move forward, because I'd love to see how we can come together. Is that, is that possible? I'm going to give it to you. Okay, uh, Ahmed Al Halfawi uh, from Egypt. Uh, I'm a scout leader. Also, I work for International Commissioner Office. That's it. Good morning. My name is Neville Tompkins. I'm the International Commissioner for Scouts Australia. I'm Wendy Freeman from Australia, and I work in the International Office. Sheridan Bunny, Deputy Chief Commissioner, Youth Program, West Australia. Kevin Pestel, Deputy Chief Commissioner, Adult Resources from Western Australia. Martin Thomas, uh, National Chief Executive, Scouts Australia. Good morning all. Uh, Chief Commissioner from South Australia, Rach Williams. Good morning. Roman Heimhuber, National Board Member, Germany. Uh, my name is Olana Halushka. I'm from Ukraine and a member of National Board. Uh, bonjour, je m'appelle Valentina Urso, je suis membre du comité régional Eurasie. Hello all, Dona Postika, Youth Advisor to the World Committee uh, from Moldova. Hi, I'm Saradi Takatan, Youth Advisor to the World, Com World Scout Committee and I'm from Lebanon. My name is Espen Holler, I'm from Denmark and I'm also a Youth Advisor to the World Scout Committee. Hello, I'm Dan Wood from the UK. Hello, I'm Olga from NSA in Moldova, and I'm project trainer and uh, trainer commissioner. Hello, Victor Diamond, uh, president organization of the Scout Movement of Kazakhstan. Hi, my name is Miriam Heidelberger. I'm the general director of Candlestick International Scout Center. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm from Manila, Philippines. I'm with Greenpeace. And I'm also here because of my nine-year-old scout son. Hi, I'm Roy Grotz from Luxembourg. Hello, I'm John May. I'm the vice chairman of the World Organization of the Scout Movement. Hello, good morning. This is Michael. I'm a deputy international commissioner of Singapore. Hi, morning. I'm KK. I'm the assistant national training commissioner from Singapore. Hello, good morning. I'm Shuaira from Scout Leader from Brunei. Okay, hello, good morning. I'm Noraini from Brunei Darussalam. I'm a Scout Leader. Good morning. I'm Lida Tessif. I'm the International Commissioner of the European Scout Association and the Youth Commissioner for the Saba Scout Council. Hi, very good morning. I'm Amir from Malaysia. I'm the program commissioner. Hello, I'm Pema Wangchuk from Bhutan. I'm national program commissioner. Hello, good morning. I'm Stephen. I'm come from Hong Kong. Um, I'm the assistant regional commissioner. Hello, good morning. I'm Jason. I'm the program commissioner of Hong Kong. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Lorena Gudiño from Mexico. Hello, I'm Martin from Scout Argentina. Uh, hello, everybody. My name's Darren Barton. I'm an Assistant District Commissioner from Hong Kong. Hello, everybody. Amin from Azerbaijan. Hello, morning, everybody. My name is Zami from Malaysia, Chief State Commissioner. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Abdul Rashid Muhammad. Uh, 
commissaire au programme Fédération Ivoirienne des Scoutistes Côte d'Ivoire. Viateur Ruchana from Rwanda. I'm Wendell Avisado, a member of the Asia Pacific Regional Scout Committee and Acting Secretary General, Boy Scouts of the Philippines. Thank you. Hello, Blaimi Rodriguez, Scout Panama, Commissional Education. Hello, I am Chi Yun Aoyang, Assistant Chief Commissioner responsible for Administration, Hong Kong Association. Hello, I'm Maina Kiranga, a facilitator in the World Scout Education Congress. I work for USID in Botswana. I'm Claire Gabi from Belgium and I'm interpreter for this Congress. Hi, I'm Krista from Belgium and I'm National uh, Program Commissioner. Hi, I am Florence from Belgium and I am Adult Resources Commissioner. Bonjour, moi c'est Benjamin Adoum, Commissaire National au Programme Association School du Togo. Yeah, thank you very much. Before I talk, I, I brought uh, congratulations, messages and uh, thanks from the people of South Sudan, the youngest scout association in South Sudan. We are, we are now almost uh, six months in the association, and I'm called Ladu Said. I'm Chief Commissioner of the Scout in South Sudan. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Mohammed Al Bahar from Kuwait. Hello, everybody. I'm Mohammed Al Bahar from Kuwait. Hi, I'm Oliver, International Commissioner of Germany. Hello, I'm uh, Ray Montano. Scout volunteer from uh, the Philippines, former also uh, Rover Scout. Mabuhay, I'm Ariel Tamayo, Boy Scout Commissioner at the Mayor de Manila University, Manila, Philippines. Hello, I'm Lai Zhou from Hong Kong, Headquarter Commissioner for Leader Training. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Roberts and I come from the World Association of Girl Guys and Girl Scouts. We're based in London and I'm a director there. Hello, my name is Lal Zirmo Echangte, State Chief Commissioner for the State of Mizoram in India. Hello, I'm Invoke. Uh, chairman of Venture Scout Council, Hong Kong. Hello, my name is Jason. I come from Macau. This is Francisco Chan from Macau, Training Commissioner. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hova. I'm the International Commissioner from Norway. Hi, I'm Berto Helle from Finland, member of National Board. Hello, my name is Niklas van Braun. I'm from Sweden. My name is Martin Björgel. I'm the Chief Commissioner of the Guides and Scouts in Sweden. Kapila Berra, Assistant Chief Commissioner, Sri Lanka Scouts. Hello, I'm Alif Wang from Scout of China in Taiwan. I'm a director of the WSEP International Association. Hello, Anna Ruth Costa, the International Commissioner of CNE Portugal. Hello, <coughs> I'm Qureshi from Bharat Scouts and Guides as a Deputy Director, Scout Leader Training, India. Hello, this is SS Rai, Regional Organization Commissioner Scout, Bharat Scouts and Guides, India. Hello, I am Andra Brate, International Commissioner of Ajayshi, Italy. Hello, I'm David McKee, the Regional Director for Europe. Hello, I'm Paolo Fiora, I'm National Chief Scout of CNGEI from Italy. Hello, I'm Mike Michele Gasapini. I'm District Commissioner and member of a training team. My name is Nargis Bolakishiva from Azerbaijan and I'm Assistant to International Commissioner. 
My name is Adrian, I'm from Romania, and I'm coordinating the celebrating of Centenary in Romania. Hello, I am Vasiliki Danel Milona. I am the president of the Greek Road Safety Institute, which was established after the unfair tragic death of my son, and I fight uh, in the struggle against traffic crashes. I should say it's my birthday today. I am away from home, but I'm really delighted and very excited to be here, especially in this session, because listening to the introduction from Cynthia, uh, we have experienced and worked together with the Supreme Court and uh, with people who violate the law, we train them. I didn't know what you are doing in this area, so I see a great challenge to join our forces. Thank you. Hello, my name is Timo Sinivuori. I am a director of uh, education of the Guides and Scouts of Finland. Finally, I am Lili Zakarian. I am from Armenia and I work as international commissioner. Good morning, Peter Illig. Uh, I'm based in the Geneva office overseeing global projects. Okay, so now I'm even more impressed <laughs> seeing all of the different places you come from, from all over the world. And I really believe that if we come together with the scouts, that it will make it possible for us to achieve this dream in our lifetime of ending torture as an investigative tool. And so I know that sounds like a, wow, how can we do that? But I have to say, wow, are there really 40 million scouts throughout the world? People always tell me, you know, the thing is you need a tipping point. There needs to come a time where everyone believes it. Everyone believes that nobody should be tortured as an investigative tool, where just because you're poor and can't afford a lawyer that it doesn't happen to you. But enough people have to know it and enough people have to believe it. And what I feel right now is that if we really come together, and I say very sincerely that I have so much hope that we can come together and work on it, that if we come together, that we can create history. Because we know that we co-create history together. Something like torture as an investigative tool, it's not something that came down and just happens. It was created by men, man and woman. It was created by us as human beings. And we can also take it within our hands to co-create a different world. I know we only have an hour together, and I wanted us to break, down, break up into groups for a moment. But before I do that, I just had two things. One is that you mentioned your, how old is your son? Your nine-year-old son. It made me think of my 11-year-old son. And, and actually, my 11-year-old son is also one of the reasons why I was so excited about the Scouts. Because I realized my son travels with me all the time, and he's been traveling with me, um, because mostly because I'm a mom and I need to take care of him. But what I have realized through the years is that, for some reason, kids get it more than adults. So the interesting thing for me is that about two years ago, I did a TED Talk. And I talked about ending torture as an investigative tool and why it's possible in our lifetime. And I got a lot of responses from a lot of people. And then I interestingly also got responses from people who were kids. I guess kids are people too. <laughs> but also their moms and their dads. And all the kids said, this is wrong. It's not right. We should do something about it. What can we do? And then I got uh, lots of responses from their parents. And they said, well, I agree with you for the most part. Um, but what can we really do? So I was always inspired. I said, you know, kids, they have it. And, and I've been told that that was also true for slavery and apartheid. That adults were sort of like, you know, this is what we can do, what we can't do. But kids were like, hmm, this is wrong. Because we know something in our moral fiber when something is right and something is wrong. And sometimes we need to take that leap of faith. But I was just thinking, too, of last time I was with my son. And he's been with me to prisons in Cambodia, prisons in India. And, you know, you have these electronic devices now, right? Game Boys and things like that. 
they drive me nuts. And so my son, of course, though when I'm in a meeting, I let him play on his Game Boy or whatever he's playing with because I know that he'll keep quiet for a while. So we were sitting um, in India, which is one of the countries that International Bridges to Justice works in, and we were actually talking about Mexico. And because first they said, well, tell us about some of the other countries. And I said, yeah, well, this is a problem, I guess, everywhere in the world. Every country that we work in, it is the same. That it is the poorest of the poor who are tortured. They have no safety and no protection because they do not have a lawyer. And I was quoting a statistic from Mexico because I had just spoken with someone who said, yes, there are 250,000 people in, in jail. 100,000 of these can't afford a lawyer, so have never had a lawyer. And out of the 100,000, 50,000 are there for nonviolent crimes under $500. And um, the prison warden in India said to me, you don't need to work in Mexico. <laughs> you know, we need to do more work here because we have a duty lawyer program in India. And he said, listen, look at this guy we need to help. He's been in jail for several months because he went to go visit his wife and in a hospital, and when he visited his wife, he stole the little water tap. You know, there's like a little water, rubber water tap thing from the hospital, worth 25 rupees, which is less than a dollar. And he said, guy's been in jail for several months. And at that point, my son, who was very intensely engaged in his Game Boy, looked up and said, that's ridiculous. The guy needs his water. And what I thought was interesting about it, again, is that every single time that I've spoken to younger people, they get it quicker than we do. Because I was standing next to a lawyer with me who just said, oh, well, that's life. <laughs> you know, happens everywhere in the world. We know that. You know, I talked to you earlier about the 12-year-old boy in Cambodia who was tortured and denied access to counsel for stealing a bike. And in the beginning, I thought, maybe it's just Cambodia. Maybe it's just Asia. But I started International Bridges of Justice with the goal of ending torture as an investigative tool by placing lawyers early on in police stations and courtrooms. And what we found is that we first started in Cambodia, then we went to China, and then started re receiving requests from virtually every corner of the world. Everybody started writing in. Burundi, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, everywhere. Latin America, Middle East, and they all said the same thing. Lawyers said, we have the exact same issue. We have people who are tortured every day as an investigative tool, it's against the law, but there's no one to support us. We are isolated. Can we work together? And one of, the, um, one of International Bridges of Justice's quotes from Wayne Arneson is when lawyers come together, we often say, take courage, friends. The road is often long, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. But deep down, you are not alone. And what we look at doing is connecting people throughout the world on this common mission. And I know I keep referring to these quotes, but I love them. They're Boy Scouts and they're Scouts quotes. But this one came from Messengers of Peace, saying, peace, it's not as simple as black and white. Look beyond the obvious black and white assumptions to find a solution. And I find so much hope in that statement, because that is exactly where International Bridges to Justice is. We know that in countries throughout the world, I'm going to put this down that our traditional way of dealing with human rights has, is often very adversarial, right? We see things as being black and white. We can protest against a government, we can do this, we can do that. And the thing about it is that actually it's not that black and white. In most of the countries that we work in, the majority of torture is not something that the government is saying to the police, you should do it. It's something that's always been done and it's Cheap, it's actually cheap. But governments throughout the world have said, how can you come together to help support us in doing advisement or rights campaigns for the population, in, in training lawyers, in, send, in setting up defender resource centers, in having, how can we come together for this? And yet, at the same time, sometimes we're stuck in a mindset which is very black and white. And the black and white mindset is, in order to do human rights, we have to fight someone. Well, there's sometimes that you do have to do that. But what we do is looking at the gap in between and saying, for this one issue of hundreds and thousands of people who are being tortured because they're poor, we can come together and we can do something together proactively. So what I would ask today is that 
we begin to think about how we might work together. Where's Kali? Is he? He's gone. Okay. <laughs> I had a great conversation um, when I was in Geneva together with Peter, and as we were talking about this issue and talking about you know how could possibly the scouts come together for it. We thought about education, but we also thought of something called circle of protection, whereby, I mean, the, the thing that is, is most difficult is that people don't have protection. If you get picked up by the police and there's no witness into the system, you'll probably be tortured. I mean, you know, I know for myself that if I get picked up by the police for something, that I am going to be scared, I'm going to be upset, but I have enough money to call a lawyer, and that will be my protection. Now, we want this for everybody, every man, every woman, every child throughout the entire world, that if you get picked up, you will have some protection. And as I've talked to kids, you know, my son, I keep talking about my son because of you, <laughs> he just had his 11th birthday. And for his birthday, he put together a fund that he said, don't give me presents, give me money so I can help the kids that I've seen in prison. Because he said, you know, it's not fair that I've met kids who are in jail for steal, you know, sleeping on a mat that they found in a garbage can. We know that we can protect them. And there's ways of coming together for it, just as witnesses in different ways. So what we talked about is maybe having um, a circle of protection. Whereas, okay, maybe we can't take care of everybody in the world, but maybe we start with the kids. Maybe if a kid gets picked up, and you wouldn't believe the kids in prison, I mean, there's kids in prison for, a family of seven was in prison in Burundi for stealing a cow, and including the kids. Well, you know what? Maybe the kid did whistle or do something, but if you're seven and you're in jail for stealing a cow, it's probably not completely your fault. And it would be great to have, at least for the kid, someone that they can call on. It's possible that maybe the scouts can help us with this in different communities throughout the world form a circle of protection so that for some of them, they can reach out and know. Now, eventually the scouts might be able to take care of everyone, which wouldn't that be great? But in the beginning, we can start with wherever we can start to actually make this happen. I don't, I was gonna, how much time do we have? 10 minutes, okay. So I'm wondering right now if we, we can all just break into just groups of whoever's in your row together. And what I'd like you to do is to... What I'd like you to do is just for a moment... Well, actually, why don't you break into your groups of three first? Three or four, whoever's in, on your row. Or however you want to do it. <laughs> Okay, now you could hear this very strange music in the background, right? Well, it's my wilderness music, which is the closest that I come to being a scout and going into the wilderness. I usually go into the wilderness in my mind. And the reason I do it is in terms of a sense of adventure, I think about, you know, what can I actually do? Like me in my natural state, what could I do in a sense of adventure? So what I'd like you to do is to maybe, before you speak, just close your eyes for one minute. Just close your eyes for one minute. And um, try and imagine a world six years from now. And in this world, it's a world where every child, every man, every woman, every child, everywhere in the world has freedom from fear for the, from the police. And that at any time, if someone is picked up, that they can call on a scout group.
that there's a circle of protection that's right there for them. If you just imagine what that might look like, what that might feel like, if you can imagine the strength, the resolve, the values of the scouts who are there, ready to protect and ready to courageously do everything that they can do. And I just want you to think for a moment of what your role is and what your role has been in creating this as a reality, either in the country that you're working in or globally supporting another country. Just actively see how your decision to see the end of torture as an investigative goal happening in your lifetime becoming a reality. And let it be as wild as it can be. Imagine that you have every superhero power in the world to make this happen. And when you're ready, just open your eyes and maybe share with the person next to you something that you saw or something that you think we might be able to do together. Okay, thank you. That is as wild as I get in terms of the wilderness. And I hope that one day all of you will take me out to the real wilderness. And I'm also hoping that one day I can take you into my wilderness of prisons and you can work together with me. So maybe just for, for a few minutes, share with the people around you something that you saw or imagined in the wilderness.